when you finish the Boston Marathon and you get greeted by a blanket, you think you're cold? <laughs> I don't think so. Yes. So doesn't the urine freeze to the dogs if they're urinating and running at the same time? They're running at 106 to 108 body temperature. They're running clinically dead. They're running so hot they don't. No, it just it shakes right out. Yeah. But you have to be careful. I mean, frostbite is definitely a, a potential. We we have all kinds of uh, apparatus to protect them from, mostly when it's windy. The prepuce can freeze. Uh, we we encounter. We have all kinds of, you know, protective device. Yes. What's their body temperature run at rest then? Uh, back to normal. We did a. The the reason I'm saying that is we did some temperature tests uh, on fall training and we um, we figured they ran hot because they run they come in you know laddered up and, and breathing deep and so we had internal probes in those dogs and I had five I think four or five young vets, and they all brought their probes and their equipment. It was cool, you know, it was young people like you, and we, we <laughs> ran all fall, and, and we ran them only like five or six miles on four-wheelers. And when they came back, they were all smiling, they're all dogs wagging their tails and standing there, smiling, and they're all clinically dead. <laughs> and all the vets, all the vets looked at their probes. This can't be, you know, this dog is, is overheated. He should be collapsed or he should be, you know, there they're looking when <laughs> Of course, as quickly as they heat up, they come calm right down. And, and every time I stop, I, especially on fall or summer runs, uh, we have water for them right, right now. They, they help cool off. It helps them cool off right now. So they do run quite hot, and lately we've done some, some thermal imaging where another deal is where people took some thermal cameras, and as we probably know, dogs sweat on their feet somewhat, and definitely on their mouth. Our dogs, the Alaskan Huskies, and I only know about the Alaskan Huskies, they actually perspire a lot less on their feet, and if you think about it, of course that makes sense, because you would lose a lot of heat through through the cold snow, plus you would probably attract more snowballs. So when we first started doing that, we expected to see bright uh, red faces and feet, but we see dark purple feet and, and bright red faces, so their feet, and then when you put a, a domesticated dog or a more domesticated dog in that team, you can tell by, by thermal imaging, you can tell that dog still sweats a lot more through his, his or her feet. Interesting finding, but yes? Is it hard to maintain hydration on the trail? Absolutely. It's as, it's as hard as, as nutrition. The, the hydration program is every bit as important as nutrition. You know. Do they eat snow? Ah, they eat little snow to cool off mostly, uh, which is a good indicator. If your whole team is dipping snow, you better start giving them more liquid. But hydration is every bit as important. And what about booties? I mean, does that help the, as far as the... Uh, booties are mostly for protective protective devices. They don't keep any... To keep them from cutting and... Yeah, yeah. They, they're a mechanical help rather than a... They're not so much forewarned. What happened there? So as we're going down the hill now, we've crested the highest part. And we, we start going on a, on a little riverlet called the Dalzell Gorge. And it's got quite a bit of uh, snaky turns, you know, ups and downs, and the river is steep and it freezes to the bottom, but it flows. So it creates what we call drum ice. It backs itself up and new layers of ice are formed on top <laughs> until the water finds a new passage. So you never really know how thick the ice is. And you drive over it, it sounds like you're on a drum. Uh, and sometimes it collapses like that, that little hole in front uh, of the, the sideways musher. If the dogs had a foot free, you know, they would be tapping it. Come on, man. when's the two-legged guy finally going to get up? <laughs> Susan Butcher fell in one of those holes, a big hole, big enough hole to hold, hold her entire sled. And uh, 20 dogs screaming and jumping on top. And of course, those ledges are sharp and, and, and steep. She had to unload all her gear from the sled, get the sled out. and and uh, load it back on to resume travel. So uh, it's probably the most challenging section for for mushers uh, because it's steep and and challenging terrain. The biggest the biggest single danger on on the race is probably the combination cold water and I mean cold temperatures and open water. It sounds crazy, but overflow, 
Overflow is a phenomenon we encounter, and I lost a friend in overflow. He, he was stranded in six foot of overflow with his snow machine, ended up standing on the machine uh, in knee deep water, and his buddies tried to go get a, a boat from Golovin, which was on the coast, and he ended up dying of hypothermia. Um, so you never know how deep the overflow is. It can be just a skiff of water on top of the ice, or it can be very, very deep and very dangerous. Uh, we get into water quite a bit, and you gotta you gotta be really careful, and really with it, to know what to what to do. As a, a quick in introduction to overflow, water can only be compressed so much, and as ice grows on the top of the water, it expands and it pushes the water under underneath itself for so long. As the ice grows, the layers of ice grow. There's there's only so much bottom, so eventually the water will find fissures and cracks and flows on top of itself. That's called overflow. It overflows through the fissures and cracks, often along the shore. Often there's more water on the shores of the lake than there is in the middle of the lake, ironically, in the winter. Um, so that's called overflow, but then there's often a concealed layer because there is snow on, on, on top of the ice. So the water will seep in between the snow and the top of the ice, and the, and the snow, of course, insulates that water. And snow is an awesome insulator, so snow can insulate two or three feet of water. And then when you get in it, you really get in it. And that's kind of a bummer. So we try to avoid water at all costs, and it can be, it can be very, very challenging to get a dog team sloshing through that stuff. And it, it's a big danger. Do you ever realize that perhaps the dogs have an instinctive awareness of what's ahead of them that way? Do no. They Resist if they no. Dangerous. No, my dogs are. They're smart, but they're not that smart. Well, I didn't know if maybe there was an instinctual. Jack London. Yeah. You know that those are all Jack London stories. You know I've been in earthquakes. I've been in volcano outbursts. I've been on floating ice. I've been scaredless. And um, <laughs> my dogs are just wagging their tails and going all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they just love to go wherever I want them to go. You know, so. Do the trail breakers try and do something when they come to overflow? I mean, Absolutely. They try to they reroute us as much as they can. Uh, the thing is, often often conditions change. I, you know, the the trail conditions change so rapidly. We can we can be going down the trail, and then the the trail pipeline or the bush pipeline is behind us. People are floundering in water. It's crazy, and and you didn't see a speck of water. Just like the other day, I ran over a moose. I came just a couple miles from here. I came upon that moose and said, oh, you know, there. But by the time we were upon it, it, I was already up and over. I thought it was sleeping in the trail. I mean, it was soft and mushy and <laughs> you know, over it I went and I looked behind me and it didn't get up. So clearly it was dead. <laughs> I, I didn't see a speck of blood, no nothing, nothing. I mean, it must have just gotten killed by a bunch of wolves. So, you know, okay, chalk one off as, you know, got by another one. Um, not a big deal. It's just, but then for the rest of the race, you hear, did you see all that blood? No, I didn't see any blood, you know. <laughs> did you see all those bones? You know, the, so everybody, I mean, if we're 60 racers, you know, and one, one's got to be first and one's got to be last, every one of those individuals has now a different, because we're spread out over a, maybe 10 day period of time or not quite maybe five days in this particular instance everybody sees that moment in their own snapshot of time which is so cool and as the stories go up the trail everybody has a different take and and if you're not real experienced travelers you, you don't realize that you can see from from no moose to a pile of bones or nothing and anything in between and that's that's cool that's kind of part of the was that this year no, that was uh, a few years ago. That's one of the dogs that actually would overeat. Uh, that's in the front. It's Jim Cooper and a dog named King standing up. He's trying to eat Jim Cooper's uh, dinner as well. <laughs> King was one of the few dogs that would would overeat all the time. He he, he was an awesome eater. Um, Alaskan Huskies are Thoroughbred mongrels, designer mutts, Heinz 57, eternal children. Uh, 
you name it, whatever whatever pulls hard and runs fast is beautiful.